Sings my soul. 
just sing in the spirit here for about a minute come on Every voice. Empty handed but alive in your hands. Singing majesty. Majesty. Forever I am changed by you. of your majesty and majesty majesty your grace your grace has found me just as I am empty
We'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when people start coming for the sake of Jesus. And we'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when we're more aware of Jesus than the movement. There's only salvation in Jesus. Says here, I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Nothing this world has to offer will ever satisfy your soul. Only Jesus will satisfy your soul. Jesus is so real. He's so near. He's the hero. He's the hero. Jesus is the hero. Could we stand and welcome Michael Miller to the pulpit and open our hearts? Thanks. Thank you guys. It's good to see everyone in the presence of Jesus. I, I played baseball in high school and college and I was a center fielder and I was lead off and I was tall, lanky and slow. And center fielders are supposed to be short, stocky and fast. And they lead off and I always told my coach, I'm like, I don't need to be a leadoff. I don't need to be in center field. I don't fit the, the mold. And he's like, it just works, baby. It just works. And me leading off this conference with these people in the room, uh, I feel tall, lanky, and slow right now. <laughs> I am just uh, in awe. I'm like, I, I know you from somewhere. And I've seen you before, and you've somehow been on my feet and ministered to my heart. There are heroes in this room, and uh, it is an honor to be among you. It is an honor to, uh, to be with you this morning. Um, I, I, uh, I love pastors. I love what we get to do. Um, I love the local church. I believe the local church is the hope of our hour. I believe people living regularly in proximity to the presence of Jesus is the X factor for the days that we're living in. And uh, you're going to be, you're going to be infused with, um, I think, the same message. I think uh, as Michael said, we, we're attempting to put our arms around where the Lord is leading us. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not going into a place that we've been before. God's doing a new thing. And new means new. <laughs> new means we haven't been there before. New means change. New means unfamiliar. New might mean scary. New might mean opposite of what you've been trained for. God is doing a new thing. And I am hopeful uh, because I believe he's doing a new thing on a local level. Uh, we have had many heralds in the church, but I believe in this hour God is marking houses. He's marking people. He's marking groups of people um, that have created a resting place, a dwelling place for the Lord. And, uh, and I want to I share with you my story in that and um, 
how I got to be up here with Michael and Jess. Um, I, I'm a Church of Christ kid. I grew up in the Church of Christ, so instruments were a stretch for me at one point in my life. Uh, <laughs> I was a a Church of Christ youth pastor for four years at a church of 100. um, I think when I left four years later, we were at about 102. Um, it It was an awesome experience, but just learning to be faithful on a local level to my 12 kids in my youth ministry. From there, I went to a larger church, a couple of thousand church, was an associate on the preaching faculty, preaching team. Um, and, and, and really started to grow in my love for the Holy Spirit. Not just, not just for the gifts and the fruit and the inward and internal transformation that he brought, but, but I started to see the power of God's presence resting on a group of people. Um, and and I, I started this journey of discovering what it would look like to build community that was first attracted to the Lord. And, uh, and that's kind of what connected me and Michael. Um, uh, when I would travel, I would go play, I was always on a golf course somewhere, and Michael would be in Dallas, and I was like, hey, can you, can you pinch hit, man? Can you preach it up a room? <laughs> we had mutual friends, and, uh, and he and I started dialoguing around what it would look like to build communities around the presence of Jesus. He was an itinerant evangelist at the time, and I just, I kept telling him, I can't wait till I get to call you pastor, because God's gonna plant a church through you, and he did, so. I'm glad Pastor Michael's here. Uh, <laughs> and um, Michael and Jess are two of Larissa and I's uh, best friends. When, when we're in a bind, uh, they're one of our first calls. Um, I've been with him and, and thick and thin and over the years and just so appreciative of our relationship. And I love what God's doing here. I, I leave Jesus Image events more in love with Jesus. I leave lovesick. I leave marked. Um, When I'm around their community, I am just so provoked in first love, and my prayer is that uh, you you will receive that impartation over the next couple of days. Um, So for the Jesus Image team, you guys are the embodiment of humility. Thank you for the way that you're going to serve. This week, I wanted to thank you in advance. Thank you, worship team. Thank you. All the parts that make up the whole here, uh, just wanted to say um, thank you, and to all the speakers. Um, again, you're my heroes. The tall, lanky, slow guy is starting out. Uh, I, I just cut off a four and a half month sabbatical. My elders approached me earlier in the year and said, would you, would you consider taking a break? And, and at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't redlining. You know, I have, typically when you're asked to take a sabbatical, it's probably because something's off. And I'm like, I'm doing great. And they're like, we really feel like we've, we've heard from the Lord that, that you need to take a uh, uh, some rest, and, uh, and so the Lord confirmed that. My wife and I took four and a half months um, just as a couple and, and uh, kids and from May to the beginning of this month, and it has been so refreshing, but the Lord has really taken me back to some of, uh, some of the original foundations and some of the things that um, he instilled in me in the early days of the community that we're currently pastoring. And uh, I've just wanted to double down on some of those revelations. And so I want to I share some core convictions that I have and what I've seen God do uh, in our small little pocket in our city and how he's reaching specifically Gen Z and millennials. Uh, th- there is a hunger that this generation has for something authentic, something real. And I believe it's the presence of Jesus. Uh, I, I really do. I, I believe that, um, and, and not just a theology of the presence, but a true encounter um, with him. We, we, we just hosted an event called Gen Z for Jesus. Uh, we had 6,000 Gen Zers uh, fill an arena in the northern part of DFW. And for 12 hours, we basically worshiped. We didn't do much more than worship. We preached the gospel and had communion and did some some other things, but to see their hunger, it was so palpable, so tangible. And I am so expectant for what is emerging in Gen Z. Are there any Gen Zers in here? Will you stand up? I just love you. Stand to your feet. What's up? Come on. Get him, God. Praise the Lord. Gen Z will be set on fire. All right. Um, I'll t- 
tell you a little of our story. So uh, Michael and Larissa Miller, we planted a community called Upper Room in Dallas, Texas. It was in the uptown, uh, downtown area, um, the homosexual district. I had an invitation from a business leader um, to gather once a week and pray uh, for our city. Uh, he actually called the room the Upper Room. Um, it was it overlooked our city on the second floor and and so the name Upper Room actually came from just the room we were meeting in that the business leader named. I, I would not name my church Upper Room if I had the... It's just Pentecost Sunday rolls around every week, like high expectations if you're Upper Room on a Sunday, <laughs> Pentecost. Um, so it was logistically, like we didn't really call it a church, we just called it a prayer meeting. And um, I, I'm made for the suburbs, like put me in the burbs. I can pastor people in the burbs, I know you. but. The homosexual, artsy, uptown area of Dallas was a stretch, and I wrestled with God. Um, we, had a, we had a history that really pointed us to start this prayer meeting. We really felt an assignment from the Lord, but once we said yes to it, uh, the Lord began to corner me. And as he cornered me, he began to strip me of all my preferences, of all my strategies, he began to strip me of my giftings and sermons. None of it worked in Oak Lawn. Again, it was a church planting graveyard. Guys came down with more resources, um, more gifts, uh, more organization, more people, and that area would chew them up and spit them out. Uh, they would all of a sudden be called to another part of the city. Uh, Oak Lawn was not desirable, like it, it just was really challenging. It was like, Lord, I, I know there's someone more qualified. I know there's people that are burdened for this demographic, but you found the wrong guy. Like it's not me. And, and oh, by the way, Lord, I'm not an intercessor. Like you've called me to sit in a room and pray. Like I, I love the lost. I wanna pray for the sick. Don't put me in this room. And and over and over, he just confirmed, I, I've called you into this room. I'm going to do a work in you first, but I will do something through you. And, and so as I sat with the Lord, I know, as I sat with the Lord, it, 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 it did not seem applause worthy at the time. Um, it, it, was, it was, I died a thousand deaths in that season, but um, I remember I was walking um, to this townhome that, that, that we had, they're in Oakland, and I'm wrestling with God and like, when is this assignment up? When are you going to send me somewhere else? And, and um, I'm like, I don't want to minister to these people. And the Lord spoke so clearly to my heart. He said, son, I didn't call you down here first to minister to them. I called you down here to minister to me. And, and, and that phrase, that was 12 years ago, that phrase I have been unpacking. It, 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 it delivered me in a moment, um, and then it propelled me into this journey of understanding what it means to minister to God, um, what it means to create an environment that uh, is first and foremost attractive to Him. Uh, around that season when I was wrestling with the Lord, someone walked up to me, and I... I I have great respect for Rick Joyner. I haven't read a ton of Rick Joyner's books, but someone gave me this book called Apostolic Ministry. And, and they said, I, I feel like this is uh, gonna give you framework for what God's building. And, and it has, I read it twice a year. It, it has just been a, a manuscript for me. And I wanna read some excerpts from it because I think it'll land in some of your hearts and put language to what you're sensing God doing and some framework for looking uh, ahead. So did you guys get those, those quotes? I didn't. Can we throw those up there? Sure, baba, boom. All right, check this out. So there's more power in a single Christian than in all the armies on the face of the earth. That's how the book starts. <laughs> this truth will become known throughout the earth before the end of the age. God dwells in his people. God dwells in his people. And when his people come to know this as a living truth rather than a doctrine, the world will then know this truth. All right. 
So buckle up. I'm going to read quite a bit. The emerging generation must have adventure in their lives. The devil often takes advantage of this need, but God put it there for a reason. The final generations on this earth are going to live the greatest adventure the world has ever known. There is no greater adventure than the true Christian life, and the true Christian life is about to be restored to the earth. Keep going. This true and ultimate adventure is food for the soul. Many try to meet this need with movies and books. To which they try to live vicariously, but none of these can ever satisfy the longing of the reality in our lives. Nothing can satisfy this longing like the true Christian life. Keep going. We must also understand that this will mean the end of the church as it is now. Radical change is coming, and those who are not discerning enough to see it and become a part of it will not survive much longer. This is not a slam against the church as it is, which has been effective in its time and a powerful salt and light in the earth and its generations. The church is also the mother of the great last day ministry, which is soon to emerge. However, just as Rachel died giving birth to Ben Hamin, the last son born to Israel, the same will happen to the church when the last day ministry is born. A major part of the church as we know it is not going to die because it has failed, but because it has succeeded. It will have given birth to the ministry that will help the world transition between the church age and the kingdom age. Keep going. When Ben Amin was born, his mother tried to name him Ben Honai, which means son of my sorrow. She named him this because she was dying. However, Israel, the father, changed his name to Ben Amin, which means son of my right hand. I think that's going to happen for some of you guys this week. A season of suffering that you've tried to label, the Lord's going to give you a fresh definition for it. The right hand of God is where Jesus sits in Matthew 6, 26, 64, the can, the right hand of power, keep going. This is where it gets salty. The reason the church emerged in the book of Acts as a force that could so change the world was because the Lord was among them. Let me read that again. The reason the church emerged in the book of Acts as a force that could so change the world was because the Lord was among them. They had encounters with him day by day. He was their message, and he did great works among them. Because of this, it was uh, not long before the most powerful influences on the planet uh, knew of these people. Not long afterwards, were in great fear of them. These believers shook the earth with their message in their lives. It will happen again. It seems as if the Lord purposefully chose leaders for his new church whom absolutely no one would follow unless these leaders were anointed with his presence. Amen? You're qualified. <laughs> there I am. Uh, the people knew that their leaders had almost all recently denied the Lord and had fled from him when he needed them most. These leaders did not have a great plan or program. In fact, there was no reason for anyone to follow them except one. The Lord had appointed them. He had anointed them, and he was with them. Their authority was the result of just one fact. The king lived in them. The first century church, the first century church really had only one thing going for them, God. He was all that they would need. The Lord was in their midst, living, doing wonders, teaching, comforting, and providing. The Lord had his first leaders in a place where they were completely dependent on him. They could not lead, build, or even teach unless he was present. They had no other plan to fall back on if he did not go with them and do the works. If the Lord did not go with them, they were helpless. This is precisely the foundation that the church is about to return to. Rick Joyner asked a question, and this is the question in this book. This is, again, these are just kind of put together quotes, but he said, what would the church look like if it were not built to attract people, but to attract God? And <clears throat> I don't know of a better way to start the presence-centered church conference than reading those quotes, but um, our hope is to put language to what we just read. And um, I think there's a misnomer that, that, that the presence of God if, if we make our churches presence-centered, that we won't reach people. Um, and this is actually unto reaching our cities. It's actually unto reaching this coming generation. So I, I want to take you to a text that's been very meaningful to me, and I want to put a prayer in your heart to start out the morning. It's Psalms 132. So if you have your Bibles, flip over to Psalms 132. <clears throat> Psalms 132, they believe, was penned by Solomon, but it's, it's insight to the life of David uh, that we can't find anywhere else. 
And <clears throat> if, if the Psalter is a mountain range, uh, Psalms 132 is Mount Everest. Uh, to understand the Psalter, you have to understand Psalms 132. David wrote around 75 Psalms and then under his leadership, another 30. So over 100 Psalms were written under David's leadership. And yet I believe Psalms 132 gives us insight to the heart behind the Psalter, the heart behind uh, David, David's eternal resume. He's known as one after God's own heart, fulfilled God's, all of God's purposes in his generation. Jesus, root of David. Jesus actually sits on the throne of David. Second Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant still being fulfilled today, but your throne, your house, and your kingdom will remain forever. D David's someone that we should study, look at, and Psalms 132 to me is the greatest insight to David's life because we read about a promise David made to the Lord, a vow David made to the Lord. Um, and this vow is a vow that I believe the Lord is provoking leaders to make in our hour. Uh, it's a vow that it's all consuming. Um, it's, it's a vow that simplifies everything. It's a vow that delivers us from It delivers us from all the demands and all the expectations and all the questions and all the complexities of the hour. When this vow hits your heart, things get simple. And simple isn't easy in our hour because culture is complex, but I believe the Holy Spirit is simplifying the bride once again to be effective. Uh, he's purifying us. My wife had a dream recently uh, well, it wasn't recently, it was probably a year ago, that in the dream, um, it's just, it's really marked me, and I, I, I think it's for the church at large. She was trying on wedding dresses, and um, in the dream, the, the attendant was bringing her these wedding dresses, wedding dresses, wedding dresses, and none of them fit. Like, they were too tight, they were kind of scandalous, revealing too much of her body, or there was a slit in the side, it was uh, sequenced, or like a, a nightclub dress, and she's just frustrated, because she's like, I am getting ready for a wedding, and so she pulls her head out of the dressing room and she whispers to the attendant, hey, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a bride and brides aren't intended to be sexy. Brides are intended to be beautiful. And I believe the Holy Spirit is power washing the bride of Christ from all that we've put upon her to be relevant, to be attractive, to have influence. I believe he's casting all of that aside and he's awakening first love in leaders, first love in shepherds, first love in pastors, so that lovers are leading his people. And they're modeling this for them so that this simplicity and purity can mark the bride because there's a beauty that the bride of Christ possesses that's actually really attractive to the world. The world is looking for beauty and we have it in the face of our beloved savior, Jesus. And we owe the world a glimpse at that beauty, but we've got to get simple, guys. In the complexities and the cultural narratives, like the knife that cuts through it is simplicity and purity. Listen, purity doesn't have to flex when she stands on a stage. Purity isn't uh, about a gift. Purity isn't about a program. When purity, though, steps on the stage, it cuts through it all. And I believe there's a purity of heart that is emerging in leaders that are after this one thing. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He has clean hands and a pure heart. What is that generation doing? Seeking God's face. And this, this marking comes from Psalms 132. Like this vow from Psalms 132. Uh, Isaiah asked a question. Isaiah, I'll, I'll read Psalms 132. But Isaiah 66.1 uh, ask this question, heaven is my throne, the earth is the footstool for my feet. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? <clears throat> David, David wants to build that resting place for the Lord. In Psalms 132, we get insight to it. Uh, verse one, remember, O Lord, on David's behalf, all of his affliction. <laughs> How he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, surely I will not enter my house nor lie on my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to 
my eyelids. Verse five is the vow. Until, everyone say until. Until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. David promised to the Lord, I believe this is when he was probably a young man, that his life would be marked by this pursuit, Jesus, that you would have a resting place uh, on the earth. And, and I, I don't believe that this vow actually was inspired by David. I believe David tapped into God's desire for a resting place on the earth. Uh, Psalm 69 talks about the afflictions that he went through, but it's, it's the famous text where Jesus stands in the temple and he says, zeal for my house consumes me. That's connected to this zeal to establish resting places on the earth. And it, 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 <laughs> I believe that desire is still central to God's heart. That God lives in many, but he rests in few. And he's looking for resting places uh, on the earth. He, he, he genuinely is looking for resting places. Uh, my wife is like very book smart. I'm not book smart. Um, I limped through college. Uh, and she had this great idea that we start to take graduate school um, together. And the only reason I said yes is because I knew I could copy off of her. Um, <laughs> And so she's like, she's like so excited about, um, uh, about the, the process of learning and all the different classes we're taking. And I'm like, what's the shortest path to me actually getting a degree and with you know, my name on it? Like, that's what I'm after. Anyway, so we took Old Testament survey. Uh, we took Old Testament survey this summer. And first chapter of my Old Testament survey class and this, this book that we're reading, the first chapter is called God's City Temple. And the first sentence provoked something in me. It, it, the first sentence was this, Eden was God's first sanctuary. I, I was like, what? Eden was God's first sanctuary. Wait a second. And, and the entire chapter is the theology behind Moses writing Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and what the Near Middle Eastern audience would have heard when a deity begins to design something. That a deity that builds something is building something primarily for himself. So we, we, we talk about creation, we talk about creationism, evolution, we talk about you know, taking dominion of the earth and, and all of those things, but... but but the first sanctuary for God was found in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. What was he creating? A home for himself. So day seven isn't necessarily about God resting from his work. It's about God actually resting in the work that he built for himself. But what does that tell us about God? Here's what it tells us about God. Is that the God that is omnipresent... The, the God who is everywhere desires to manifest somewhere. You got to get this. The God who's everywhere. He who, he who highest heights, he's there. Lowest the lowest, he's there. The God that spoke the universe into existence that's still expanding, holding the stars in his hands. He has a desire to manifest in time and in space. Genesis 3.8, he would walk in the coolness of the day. What's the coolness of the day? A specific time. In the garden, he's coming to commune with Adam. It, it, Eden's design reveals something about the creator's desire. And that desire exists today. That desire to, to walk among us, to, to dwell in us and to walk among us. It is still central to his heart. And you can trace this from Genesis all the way to Revelation 21, that that tabernacle and his home will descend and the earth again will be his resting place. But, but until that age comes, I believe, church, we are to, as pastors, build homes that are first marked by him. Like, 
One of the things that the Lord's been speaking to me is when he comes to the temple, it's the first two words. He said, my house, my house, not our house, not your house, but my house. It's his house. And I know you got houses like my kids all the time try to flex in the house. And it's the time I go, huh? This is my house. (laughs) You need to be reminded of that. And as pastors, we need to know whose house we're stewarding. We're stewarding his house. And his house though, listen, his house needs to be marked by him. (laughs) Not just in word, but we as pastors and stewards need to learn in our context. And listen, I can give you revelation and understanding of what it looks like in our world, but the presence of God is not a science. It's not a formula. The presence of God is an actual person. And it is more of an art and a romance. It is something that like, we are students of God's presence. We are students of his coming, his arrival, his staying. When we host him, like what did he say? Where did he go? How do we submit to one another? Like we are in constant dialogue around what does it look like for us to rightly respond to the Lord? Why? Because he wants to manifest in time and in space. In time and in space in time and in space. Does it mean that we don't have an agenda? For sure not. Like we have an agenda, we play, but ooh, we are holding it so loosely. It, it's, I think it is the, to be the defining thing for the church in the days ahead. Church is marked by his presence. There, there's everything else in this. And, and David, David in Psalms 132, he, he taps into this desire that God has. He's like, he's like I am going to use the strength of my days to see this reality manifest. And so he makes this vow. Um, he makes this vow. And so six, he's reflecting on it. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrath. We found it in the field of Jar. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. He starts to speak to the Lord. (laughs) Arise, O Lord, to your resting place and let the ark of your strength, you and the ark of your strength, let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your godly ones sing for joy. This was the vow that David made. Oh God, that you would find a home. Uh, we'll see David fulfill that. Go to First Chronicles 13 really quickly. Uh, I'll come back to Psalms 132, but. Uh, First Chronicles 13 is, is David's actually now in the position to fulfill it. He's made this vow that I'm gonna establish a resting place. God's anointed him now and positioned him to actually fulfill the vow that he spoke. And, uh, and it's, it's found in verse, verse three is his speech. Uh, I'm not gonna stay long on this, but it's, it's one of my favorite verses as a leader. Um, First Chronicles 13, three. He has the Levites and all the commanders and everyone's listening to him. And this is his political agenda, verse three. Let us bring back the ark of God to us for we didn't seek it in the days of Saul. The, the spiritual landscape of Israel at the time is that the, the, the ark, which is the token of his presence, was stowed in a barn. It wasn't even the holiest of holies. Like Israel is the definition of religion, form, no power. Activity, near God, but not connected to him. And David is saying, hey, there's, there's a new sheriff in town. Like there's a new leader in town. And we didn't do this then, but we're doing it now. And, and this wasn't a popular thing to say. Like remember all the affliction that he went through. He's about to be afflicted significantly because the box, whenever they break it out, it kills things. Like let's just stow it away. Let's like, let's just kind of have a monument where we remember what it was. But man, getting too close to it, it just messes things up. Welcome to this pursuit. It does. It, 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 it's not... Remember David and all of his afflictions. It, it sounds good, but, but this with teeth 
And, and David, what, here's what I love about David. We know that we, he made a vow. So he made a vow. That vow that he made in Psalms 132 was before 1 Chronicles 13. But what I love about David in this moment is David is saying as the leader, and, and these are the kind of pastors I believe are in this room. He's saying, I'm in the position that I'm in because I've been pursuing this. And if I'm going to be your leader, you're actually going to follow the one that's leading me. I'm not going to wear the stuff and actually just flex in front of you. I'm going to wholeheartedly pursue this one who's put me in this position. And as a nation, you're going to follow me. Let us pursue the ark. Are you with me? Like there's a new breed of leaders that there's a new breed of leaders that are first followers. Like the leadership thing, I love the leadership principles and the wisdom that transcends not just church leaders, but business leaders and the whole thing. But but gosh, I have a conviction that leadership in the kingdom has to look a little different than just wisdom in the world. Like, like we're, we're not leading because we're leaders. We're leading because we're first followers. And, and what the earth needs in this hour, it needs the active leadership of Jesus, which is different than Jesus' leaders. Jesus' leaders are amazing. Don't get me wrong. You're amazing. You're amazing. We're all amazing. Gifted leaders, like awesome, awesome. But it's not enough. We have to have the active leadership of Jesus. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That, that, that the distinct mark of God in us, among us, with us, is what people encounter when they come into the, the uh, atmospheres and communities that we're called to lead. So, so, so let's, let's, we're going after the ark. So what does David do? He comes up with a plan. And the plan goes south. Uh, they get this card, Uzzah, whose name means strength, which is really a fascinating study. Reaches up, touches the ark, he's killed. And, and it, it actually brings great reproach to David's big rollout. Like, hey, we're going to go after the ark. And, and it's like, dude, people die when that happens. And so look at this. Look at this. Verse 12 is a verse that I felt like was going to agitate some hearts. It, this has agitated me. Verse 12, David, so the anger of God broke out against Uzzah. Uzzah's dead, he's buried. And so verse 12, David was afraid of God that day saying, and this is the question, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? In essence, he's saying, how do I fulfill that vow? How do I fulfill that vow? I, I have the right intention. I have the right intention. I have the right desire but someone's dead now and everyone's looking at me. And he wrestles with this question for, uh, for three months. He stows the, the, the ark at Obedidim's home. God blesses Obedidim. And then in, in 15, he picks up the narrative. Look at 1 Chronicles 15. <clears throat> David discovered something. He discovered the prescriptive measures for creating a resting place for the Lord. There's, there's prescriptive instructions to us in how to create a resting place for the Lord. It, 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 it's very specific. It's very biblical. And so David found that in 1 Chronicles 15. He said, now David built houses for himself in the city of God, uh, in the city of David. And he prepared a place. Here's that place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one is to carry the ark of God, but the Levites. For the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. This verse hit me when I was in Oakland because God said, I didn't call you down here to minister to them. I called you down here to minister to me. And I'm like, is that even in the Bible? And so I got Google, minister to God. And this po verse popped up and I'm like, oh, what did David discover? What did David discover? Well, David discovered is that, is that I, I, I don't want to talk too much about David's tabernacle, but it's a fascinating study as leaders, especially when Jesus says, my house is a house of prayer. I think David discovered what that looks like. Um, he gathers musicians and singers, musicians and singers, musicians and singers. And, and he puts them around the box. And look at this, follow me. Uh, David assembled all of Israel, Jerusalem, Ark of the Lord's place, he prepared it. Verse 12. 
He said, you are the heads of the fathers' households of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord of God Israel to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinances. This is important. What are the ordinances? He takes singers with instruments, cymbals, uh, sounds of joy, uh, verse 19, singers, He-Man, someone named their kid He-Man, such a good name, He-Man, Asaph, Ethan, uh, then you have all those other guys, Chenaniah, chief of Levites, was in charge of singing, he gave instructions in singing because he was skillful, so you see there's a level of excellence, but he brought in the Levites, he brought in the artisans, he brought in these creatives, why? Because God gave David insight to his desire. He gave him insight to his desire. Like around the throne, Revelation 4 and 5, they have harps and bowls. Why? It doesn't matter why. All that matters is that we read it in the Bible and God prefers it. What does he prefer? Harps. What are harps? Stringed instruments. What does that mean? When stringed instruments are played, it moves his heart. I don't understand it. But I know when David showed up with the harp, demons fled Saul. And I'm watching like, like that one prayer meeting on Sunday night. Now in our context, again, this is just what it looks like for us. It's morning, noon, and night. It's, it's, it's hundreds of people that, that sit in an empty room mainly and they sing songs to Jesus. And I have watched people walk into that an atmosphere, that atmosphere, a place, space and time where God is habitating. And I have watched him do what only he can do. The homosexual community, everyone for some reason thought I like became the, I became the guru, you know, like, oh, you're successful in this neighborhood. So everyone was like reaching out to me and I'm like, I just asked him to sit in the room. Like, I, I just asked him to come and enjoy God's living room. I'm not even talking to them about their sexuality. They're just sitting in the living room. One guy, he had been coming for a long time. He was, he was wrapped in drag and uh, just in that lifestyle. And he had given his life to the Lord. And he came up in tears one time. He goes, you need to know me. I was, I was in the parade. I won the pageants. Like I was a big deal out there, but I'm a part of your community now. And I'm like, well, what do you, what do you experience? He goes, you guys start singing. And I sit in the back corner and it feels like someone's giving me a hug. And I'm like, awesome. He's like, do you have a program for me? Yes sit in the corner and let us sing. And did, did, the, did the conversation about his sexuality come up? Of course it did, but he wasn't, that wasn't the agenda. The agenda was to introduce him to a person. And, and, and these environments create that context. They create context where people, you know, the last four words in Ezekiel are powerful. Put up Ezekiel chapter 48 verse something. <laughs> it's really a powerful verse, but this, this verse, I'll find it. This is, so there's a millennial temple that's coming and not to get, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go here. The millennial temple. So he starts describing it and it's this temple that is to come. He gives the intricacies of it and he's like talking about the walls, talking about this river that's coming out of it and eight chapters he goes about the priest and everyone that's gonna participate in it. And then the last chapter, it's like on Google Maps when you pull out of Google Maps, like we've been walking the streets and seeing the street corners, and then he's like goes to a 30,000 foot view, and, and he gives us great insight in the city. Look at this, it's, uh, it's Ezekiel 48, verse 35. Last four words in the book of Ezekiel. Last four words in the book of Ezekiel, check this out. And the, the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, so it's a big, big city, but he names the city. Guess what the name of that city is? The Lord is there. Come on, why is it named the Lord there? Because when you walk into that place, the only thing you're gonna be able to go say is, he's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. And may that, may that be the aim of our leadership that when people come into our communities, is there preaching? Yes. Is there worship? Yes. Is there kids ministry? Yes. Are there all the tangibles and things that we're doing? Yes, but it's unto this one reality. The Lord is there. 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 So I've got, I've got four minutes. Um, I, I have a graph that I want to share with you, and I'm probably not going to walk thoroughly through it, but I talked about Jesus' leadership, and I call it man's leadership. So forgive me if my, my terminologies are, are not exact, but, but 
I believe we really need Jesus' active leadership in our hour. And I think there's activities that we participate in as leaders that increase his activities among us. Um, but, but, but it's challenging because um, in the natural, at times, it doesn't seem like it's going to be fruitful or beneficial. And, and so I want to put this graph up and, and walk you through it a little bit. Um, I, I, all of these categories are important. All of them are important. So I'm not, I'm not diminishing one, but I am saying that, that, that the ones on the left are primary to the ones on the right. And the ones on the left actually impact uh, the ones on the right. Because presence, presence-centered leadership, uh, it, it, it's challenging. It, it's taken me a decade to actually begin to articulate what some of, 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 of the revelations and values that have marked our community and, and my leadership. And, and I feel like the Lord had given me this. So the first is presence, the presence of one over the presence of many. So, so you know, we've had communities that, that reach people, but we need communities that are marked by the person of Jesus. And, and the misnomer is that, well, if you do that, that you're not actually gonna reach people. But I, I, am, I am telling you, we have led more people to the Lord over the last 10 years in worship, in a culture of worship. Worship isn't an activity. People are like, how do you guys worship for an hour, hour and a half? And you have a standing, you know, a line outside your door before services. And you've got uh, all these millennials on Sunday night. Sometimes service goes for hours upon end. How does it happen? Well, I think it's because we treated worship as an activity instead of worship as a culture. And when, when people come into a culture, they submit to that. And worship has become such a culture in our midst of ascribing unto him who he is that the revelation of the Lord falls in worship. And I'm, I'm meticulous about what we say to him and what, we put in the wor- what words we put into the body because worship isn't asking. Worship isn't intercession. Worship is declaring who he is. It's agreeing with who he is. And as we see his nature faith comes in the room, faith around those characteristics and attributes of him. And, and when faith enters a room around the nature and characteristic of Jesus, hearts begin to open up and we just introduce them to the one that we're singing to. Like, like I, I, think, I think worship is a form of evangelism. Strangely enough, we can preach the gospel from those places, but, but we have, we've relied on, yeah, I, I won't go there. So presence, Presence people. I think first love is so important. Um, Second love is not first love. Loving Jesus isn't doing things for Jesus. And, and, And so that worship component is how we collectively love him. It's first love. Luke 7 is a, is a fascinating study just for time's sake. I don't have time to go into it a lot. But Jesus enters into a Pharisee's home. And he sits where he's asked to sit. He eats the meal. He's like obeying all the protocols. But there's a woman that got within proximity to him. And she crashes the dinner party. With her tears, with her oil, and with her kisses. And, and what's fascinating about Luke 7, this is something you can look at, but in Luke 7, Jesus gives commentary on his experience entering into the house. Jesus goes, listen, Simon, when I came in, you gave me no water for my feet. Hey, when I came in, you gave me no kisses. When I came in, you gave me no oil. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, I'm readily available to receive those things from you. I want them from you but I will honor your response to me when I enter into your house. And the key is, is that Jesus is the guest of honor, but as soon as he shows up, Jesus is the guest of honor, and as soon as he shows up, he becomes the host. And that exchange is so important for us as leaders to model for our people, because he can do more in those moments. So loving Jesus, um, and it's unto loving people. Uh, praise and worship, preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching is so important, but it's so much easier to do it when he's there. <laughs> Am I right? Um, immeasurable versus measurables. Uh, 
I could talk about that, but we're driven by metrics and it's really hard to measure the presence of the Lord. It's really hard to put metrics around it. Um, yeah, um, uh, heaven to earth, uh, I'll, I'll end with this one, intimacy influence. Um, I think influence is an idol today. Uh, clicks, likes, views, um, it, it, intimacy, or influence is the fruit of intimacy. Um, there, the Lord said, there's many that are influential for me, but they're not intimate with me. And, and we can get so busy leading people that, again, we're not connected to the source that is him. The, the influence that he bestows upon us, it has to come from him. Not, the, it, it, how you get there is how you sustain yourself in that place. Whatever he births, what he births, he grows. What he gives you, he's committed to. But what you conjure up and bring, you're committed to that in your strength. And it's just a miserable race. I, I could, yeah. Um, following Jesus versus leading men. Um, again, he's looking for followers that are leaders. He's not looking for leaders. And, and those followers that are leaders, there's, a, there's an innate thing that, you know, for me, I took our, our executive teams here. Would you guys stand up real fast? This is Upper Room, guys. I love y'all. My executive team and amazing. What's up? So I took, I took most of them through uh, Psalms 132. We studied it for six months weekly. Weekly. Why is this important? Why is Psalms 132 important? What did David understand? We, we, we dove so deep into that, but it begins with us. What I'm talking about, it's not, it's a small consensus of people that are living in proximity to the presence of God. And it, it's like that hunger multiplies. And so um, following Jesus versus leading men, one thing versus many things. Again, simplicity, purity, devoting ourselves uh, to the Lord. So will you put your hand on your heart? I don't know of a better way to start out than to ask you to pray a prayer with me. And it's the vow that David prayed. It's the vow. And uh, if you're feeling conviction, like just a realignment uh, to the one thing um, with your hand on your heart, I, I want you to stand to your feet. I want, I want you just to recommit this vow to the Lord with me. I think you're gonna hear this from just about every speaker, but uh, Lord Jesus, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, you are the one thing. I am where I am because of you. <laughs> Lord, you you are the head. Lord, teach us to create resting places for you on the earth. All right, let me just pray. Jesus, I pray that, that, that you would mark tangibly hearts in this room with this one thing cry, Lord. This one thing. Lord, that this one yes, this one yes will result in a thousand no's. Let me say it again. This one yes will result in a thousand no's. Lord, teach us to protect our yes this morning. Lord, it is this and this alone. It is one thing and it is your beauty. It is your leadership. It is your presence, oh God, marking us first. Marking our hearts first, marking our marriages first, marking our families first, marking our leadership teams first, God. Mark us again, God. Mark us today. Mark us tomorrow. Lord, deposit something fresh and real that is your zeal for your house in the name of Jesus. Lord, build resting places in America. Build them in every city represented. Lord, may you build your house. Your zeal, God. Your zeal and your leaders. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. And I really hope that this session has been a blessing to you. I pray that you've been exhorted, you've been edified, that you have been built up in the depths of your being, that a new faith has come, and that you feel like the Lord put you here as a, in a Kairos moment for this moment in your life. And I really believe that's what's happening. I'm going to ask everybody today to be generous and give to the Lord's work. I'd like to read a few passages to you regarding the Lord's generosity and what he expects from us as his children. 
Exodus 23 says this, The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Here we see in Exodus 23, verse 19, the, the priority of the principle of firsts regarding our relationship with the Lord. I like to pray first in the morning. I love my wife first uh, in our family context. And what we do first actually expresses love. And so here the Lord says, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the Lord's house. So what is the motive in biblical giving? And by the way, if we as leaders, as pastors, as shepherds aren't living this, if we're not generous, not just towards the house that we're leading, but towards houses that have impacted us, if we're not doing that, we cannot expect the flock to do that. And one of the principles that Jessica and I have lived by is to, is to fund and support other ministers. And one of the principles that Jesus Image lives by on a monthly basis is the financial support of other churches, missionaries, evangelists, and people who are making a difference in the world. And so if you really want to experience the culture of Jesus image, it's impossible to experience it in its fullness without carrying the culture of generosity that we believe the Lord has taught us through the scriptures and through life experience. So I want to invite you to do the same and see the first fruits as an expression of love. Firsts matter, as Jesus asks even for our first love in the book of Revelation. Romans 11 Verse 16 says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now obviously here the context is Israel and the Gentile church, but nevertheless a principle is being revealed to us. If that which is first is holy, it gives the opportunity for the entirety of the lump to be holy. And this is the power of origin. This is the power of what we call preeminence. This is the power of firsts. If the first is holy here, if the first fruit is holy in Romans 11, the entire lump is holy. And I want to end with this passage. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Generosity is an expression of honor. In fact, contextually in the scriptures, when the Lord instructs us to honor our parents, contextually, he is also speaking of financial support. So how much more should we express our honor to the Lord, to his work, to the storehouse that feeds us? How much more should we express that through our generosity? And so I want to invite you today Sow into something, especially you pastors. Sow into a movement. Sow into something, even if it's not here. Make it a culture of your life to sow into somebody who is carrying something that's similar to you, who is going after breakthrough in line with what you're going after. This does so much. Of course, it opens the windows of heaven, but it also keeps our heart in the posture of celebration over competition. It's an amazing way to stay under the favor of the Lord. And so if you'd like to give today, I'd like to invite you to do that. I want to encourage you to do that. You can text the number on your screen. You just text GIVE to that number on your screen, I should say. And God will bless you. He's promised to bless us. And we deeply appreciate your love and support. Let me pray for you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Thank you for giving to us all that we have. And so we gladly give it back to you. Let your blessing rest upon your people. Let your blessing rest upon every pastor listening. Upon every church. I pray for miracles in these churches. Miracles, Lord, with facilities and staff and missions and equipment that's needed to get the gospel out. Let your miracle working power flow in response to this generosity for your kingdom. Your word says, Lord, that he who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. So I'm praying according to your promise. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Love you so much. God bless you. Bye-bye.